Halito, and welcome to Native Chalk Talk, a podcast by Natives for all. Here, we're keeping our Native ancestors' stories and history alive, while also sharing with you our Native cultures, traditions, and more. I'm Rachel Youngman, a Choctaw originally from Anadarko, Oklahoma. I hope you'll enjoy this journey with me as we learn from our Native American guests. And stay tuned for the end of each episode, where we'll talk about some great ways to support Native causes and or Native-owned businesses. Let's get started. Potential is everywhere in the Choctaw people. It's in our schools and students. It's in our small businesses and entrepreneurs. Potential is in our lifestyle and health. It's in our culture and heritage. Passion and commitment is in our blood. Ingenuity and economy are a tradition. And the Chata Foundation was founded for this potential. To cultivate minds and hearts, to stimulate ideas and passions, to extend lives and improve health through education, and to preserve and promote the power of our past. The Chata Foundation, meeting the potential of the Choctaw people. In, uh, in 1892, the uh, Comanche Kiowa Reservation was reduced to 480,000 acres. Wow. Uh, that's 750 square miles. And the Comanche Kiowa tribes, by reservation treaty, owned the Fort Sill baseland and expected to take it back when the army left. They lived some distance from the base. Quanta Parker's star house was at Cash, about six miles from the main base at Port Sill. And the Comanche Kiowa agreed to let the Apaches have their reservation at Port Sill. Uh, the, they were making good money by renting their grazing land to ranchers uh, who built Quanta, his star house in appreciation. It would make even more selling the army of the Fort Sill land for the, uh, for the Apaches. And I guesstimate uh, that they were going to sell them about 150 square miles. Mm. The uh, reason that uh, the, the Comanche and the Kiowa uh, disliked uh, the Apaches and had had a little sit down with uh, uh, General Scott, mm, who was yeah. the captain at the time, and uh, he was he was there their uh, interface with the uh, the army. They told him, "We don't like the Apaches, but we're willing to uh, to have them come and uh, and use the land, and uh, maybe uh, you uh, you can buy it from us for them." And their, their, their dislike for the Apaches goes back to, uh, to pre-Civil War days when the uh, Comanches considered the Apaches invaders of their buffalo hunting lands. And after a long series of battles drove the Apaches, except for the Lipans, who were no threat traders, west of the Pecos River. The Apaches still slipped onto the buffalo ranges to make meat and take hides when they thought the Comanche Kiowa weren't around. Mm. Yet it's it's not unusual. Uh, and and I uh, tell uh, a tale about that in uh, in the Yellow Boy, uh, first Yellow Boy novel, which is called Killer of Witches for the, uh, for the Kiowa, uh, Comanches to join the Apaches to make war on the white eyes. Uh, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, that, that kind of thing. Right. So originally I had said to you, you know, you've got the Apache, Kiowa and Comanche tribes in 
and the hundreds of people living on this base. And that's because I know the base is having like what it is today, about 94,000 acres. But even then, what I, my view of the base used to be kind of just these certain areas. And when you opened my eyes to, well, it was 480,000 acres, even 94,000 acres is a lot, but 480,000 acres, it makes sense why they didn't run into each other. Cause I was like, well, here were these tribes that used to hate each other or get in each other's way, you know, and there were raids and wars and that kind of thing. And all of a sudden they're all in the same place, but you're, you, that really but, was interesting to me that they were. Yeah, the, 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 the Comanches and Kiowas, and there was a, there was also a, a smaller group with the Apache, uh, with the Comanches mm -hmm. called the uh, Kiowa Apache. Uh, they they lived out quite a distance from the from the main base. They lived on their on their grazing lands and uh, raised cattle and uh, uh, basically rented it out. As I said to uh, uh, to the ranchers. Okay. So interesting. And, you know the the this. This business about the size of the acreage that they had for their reservation is is not unusual. Uh, around around 1880 uh, or so, there was about uh, one and a half million acres for uh, for all of the Indian tribes in the United States, and by uh, uh, the turn of the century, it had gotten down to, uh, to about 40 million. Oh, wow. Yeah. They, <laughs> they were just being literally robbed of their land. Yeah. It's so, so sad. You had mentioned to me once that the Comanche and Kiowa had an alliance going even prior to there being prisoners at Fort Sill, but why did they dislike the Apache? Well, uh, as as I uh, as I say, that their dislike goes back to the pre Civil War days when uh, the the Comanches considered the Apaches invaders of their of their buffalo hunting lands, and after a long series of battles, they drove the Apaches, except for the Lipans, who were no threat traders, uh, west of the Pecos River, and so uh, the the Apaches still slipped uh, onto the buffalo ranges to make meat and, and take hides when they thought the uh, Comanche Kiowa weren't around. And there, there are uh, even records of the Comanches crossing the Pecos and uh, going into uh, the Mescalero area uh, to, uh, to uh, burn out some of the Apaches, just, just I think for uh, for meanness, but uh, hmm. it was not unusual for uh, for them, even though they were about enemies, to still join the uh, Apaches to make war on the uh, on the white eyes. I'd love to talk about Quanah Parker and Geronimo. I always assumed everyone knew about Quanah Parker, but I run into people all the time who haven't even heard of him. So real quick, Quanah Parker was a great Comanche warrior, and he ultimately had to make the tough decision, as I mentioned earlier, that a lot of people had to, uh, to surrender the tribe to the U.S. government, and he ended up in Fort Sill as well. Something I never thought of until you and I started working on this episode together is how similar Quanah and Geronimo's situations actually were. So how many years were the tribes kept on base? Uh, not very long. The, the, uh, the Chiricahuas uh, wound up having, uh, within, within a year, they had uh, 12 villages of, uh, of uh, what are called picket fence houses. They, they're uh, basically houses that are built around four posts and uh, uh, they nail the boards up vertical. I mean, it's it's like an industrial production house, but uh, uh, they they were actually quite adequate for what uh, for what the Apaches had, and, and were actually much better than what they had at uh, at uh, Mount Vernon Barracks. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, 
the, the Apaches started living there in their own villages along uh, uh, Medicine Creek and Cache mm -hmm. uh, a, a, about a year after they got there. It, the, when they got there, it was, it was uh, uh, late in the fall and they, and they wound up having to spend the winter in uh, tents and uh, wiki-ups that they made up along uh, uh, Medicine Creek. And so uh, uh, what happened when the, uh, when the Comanches came in, uh, it, it took a year or two for them to get uh, straightened out about who was going to live where and that, and that kind of thing. But they really weren't on the base as such for a very long time. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah, that's that's such a big thing to know now that there was the base, but then there, there was that reservation land around that area. So right. it's crazy to me to think that they were in those areas long enough that some people like the babies, you know, whether it was a reservation or Fort Sill itself, the babies that were born there, the children that lived there, this was a life that that they knew, like if they were born in Fort Sill, then that's what they knew for a little bit. <laughs> so, yeah. so interesting. In fact, there are Apache today that are known as the Fort Sill Apache. According to their website, the Fort Sill Apache tribe is comprised of the descendants of the Chiricahua and Warm Spring Apaches who lived in southwestern New Mexico, southeast Arizona, and northern Mexico until they were removed from their homelands and held as prisoner of war prisoners of war by the United States from 1886 to 1914. Fort Sill Apache tribal members are descended from 81 former prisoners of war who received allotments in Oklahoma after their release. It's, you know, it's sad to me because they were out there roaming free and yes, they had their battles going on. It must've been a stressful life, but they were meant to be born free and, you know, riding their horses around out there in that, that climate and that environment. And it's just sad to think of them like, now we're going to move you over here. Well, you, you know, what what happened was that uh, uh, Asa Dak Lugie, who was uh, Geronimo's uh, nephew and who was the, the son of, uh, of uh, Geronimo's sister, quote, quote, mm -hmm. um, paid with his own money to go to Mescalero to look it over to see if in fact it could support uh, people moving from Fort Sill uh, to Mescalero and, uh, and having a cattle herd. And he was very impressed and uh, asked the Mescaleros if they wanted uh, the uh, Chiricahuas uh, there on the reservation with them. And, it's kind of an odd situation because uh, the, the Mescalero Reservation was one of the few that wasn't picked to pieces by people trying to, uh, trying to steal the land. And uh, they were worried that they were going to lose it because there just wasn't enough of them there to justify it. And so they mm -hmm. wanted the, uh, the Chiricahuas to, uh, to, to come to Mescalero and about 160 did. Hmm. Okay. The, the other 81 uh, wanted to like Oklahoma and wanted to wanted to stay near uh, Fort Sill. Mm -hmm. So uh, those who stayed in Oklahoma were were released actually a year after those that went to Mescalero, and they were given uh, uh, Comanche Kiowa land that had been lost uh, through a process called reversion uh, after the owner died without heirs. Okay. And so uh, uh, they had expected that uh, if they were going to farm, they would get uh, uh, 80 acres per uh, Chiricahua. And if uh, they were going to uh, uh, ranch, they would get 160. Well, you know, that's uh, ranching uh, on 160 acres, uh, you really couldn't handle more than uh, three or four cows as thin as the grass was. 
On March 4th, 1905, Geronimo and other notable warriors and chiefs rode in Theodore Roosevelt's presidential inauguration parade in DC. Geronimo was 60 years old by this time. Tell us more about that event and who also rode in that parade. Okay, the, the, uh, the five besides Geronimo were uh, Little Plume, who's a pagan or a Pygan uh, Blackfoot, uh, Buxton Charlie, who was Southern Ute, uh, there was Quanta Parker, Comanche, uh, Hollahorn Bear, who was Brule Sioux, and American Horse, who was Ogallala Sioux. And they, uh, uh, they uh, were quite distinctive. They rode in the parade in front of, uh, of uh, a, a marching band from Carlisle who were, who were made up of Indians and they weren't very far behind uh, the, the uh, president and his uh, big fancy automobile with the top down. <laughs> and this was a big deal, right? The non-natives wanted to see all these Indians they had heard about in the news and who finally so-called had been defeated and surrendered. But was this a big deal to um, those folks that rode in the car? Uh, yeah, it was a big deal. And and then a few days later, Geronimo and the others got to speak to the president at the White House, right? Yeah, that's, that's correct. Hmm. Um, so, you know, obviously you're coming to the White House, you're in this car riding up to people are cheering you on all of this stuff. And then they get to the White House. What did Geronimo ask for? He, uh, he asked Roosevelt to uh, return him and the other Chiricahuas to the place of his birth, which was on the headwaters of the Rio Gila. Ah. And then listen to Geronimo's words. Again, he's still a 20 year prisoner of war at this point and up until his death. So he said, I pray you to cut the ropes and make me free. Why did Roosevelt not want to let Geronimo and his people go back to their homelands? I don't understand. Uh, Roosevelt was like just about every other uh, government bureaucrat and uh, army uh, manager in the United States. He feared that if the Apaches returned to uh, uh, Arizona and New Mexico, the settlers uh, wanting payback for all the blood and treasure the Apaches had cost them and start a, a, a bloody war. Hmm. Wow. That would make sense, I guess, but still, it's it's really sad. He was a 20 year yeah, prisoner of it war. It really is. Oh. So, were the Chiricahua Apache finally allowed to go free at some point? They could leave if they wanted to leave the shelter of the reservation in their culture. Okay. I mean, they all chose to stay on the reservation. Hmm. You mentioned um, in another Facebook post, obviously I've been looking at your Facebook. <laughs> 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 so you wrote, after the parade, Roosevelt is said to have told his advisors he hoped he never heard Geronimo's name again. Why is that? Geronimo was the second most popular man in the parade. Hmm. Uh, when he rode by, people shouted his name. They left expensive seats that they had paid good money for <clears throat> to run along the side of the street to get a better look at him. Wow. And Roosevelt felt like people were paying as much attention to uh, Geronimo as him. And they probably were. They probably were. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. You can't share the spotlight. You're just, and you're going to keep this guy a prisoner of war even longer. Good God. Um, so before we go much further, I want to remind folks to check out your website. So wmichaelfarmer.com to see the whole array of these fascinating books and created from years and years of Michael's research. So check them out, y'all. When you read about Geronimo, you see statements like in your book, he was hated by some of his own people, loved by others, but respected by all. Tell us more about Geronimo, the man. Uh Geronimo believed that Chiricahua had to teach their children their myths and legend to uh, preserve their culture. 
if he felt threatened, he would leave and start a war. When he broke out the last time, the Chiricahua broke into two groups, one for peace with the white eyes led by Chato and Loco, and one for war led by Geronimo. He was paranoid about being put back in the guardhouse. Uh, he had a thirst for alcohol, but he wasn't, in my opinion, an alcoholic. He was pragmatic in his dealings with the white eyes and rarely hesitated to express an opinion. Hmm. I I like that description of him. I, I mean, I know that there's the part of his um, drinking a little too much drink, drink, but at the same time, it, it just seems like someone that it makes sense to me why people thought he was interesting. And I hate to say that in a way because it sounds like we've created a novelty out of him, but he was an incredible warrior and he, he just had an interesting story on top of everything else. So Geronimo once said, I cannot think that we are useless or God would not have created us. There is one God looking down on us all. We are all the children of one God. The sun, the darkness, the winds are all listening to what we have to say. You mentioned he became a Christian, correct? I've always wondered if that's true. And what do you know about that conversion to Christianity? Well, it's it's absolutely true, and it's uh, it's a it's a good story. <clears throat> it's, it's a little long. Uh, he was uh, after after he uh, uh, chose the Jesus road, and that's the way that that uh, the the missionaries uh, taught Christianity that you needed to leave the old self behind and get on the Jesus road. And, uh, and follow it. Uh, he was a by the church rules Christian for three years before he decided that it was too hard and went back to the Apache God Usen. Uh, and I, I found that uh, a lot of what I had had come to believe about my faith uh, was was uh, both reinforced and challenged by the way that uh, that he had become a Christian and then and then had refused to uh, to live by the the rules that the uh, the church mm. put on him. So while at Fort Sill, he was also paid <clears throat> by the U.S. Army as a scout, right? No, he was actually paid as a private. Uh, the the, uh, they, they didn't have any, uh, any way to uh, pay him otherwise. So he had to be in the army. Uh, and his job was to be the chief of one of the 12 Apache villages along uh, Cash and Medicine Bluff Creeks. An article in the Oklahoman called Indian Curator Dispels Myths of Geronimo by Joan M. Biskupic quotes the historian and archaeologist Tawana Spivey. Tourists came to see him, Spivey said, adding that Geronimo became a hero for having survived the U.S. campaign against the Indians. He loved having his picture taken. He would pose in feather war bonnets, something he probably never wore, or he'd be staged skinning a buffalo. Also within that article, Margot Roby, assistant curator at the Fort Sill Museum Collections, describes Geronimo saying, he was a ham, cantankerous. He refused to speak English and set himself apart from the other Indians. When he would set up his stand by the train tracks to sell bows, arrows, walking canes, and the like, he wouldn't hitch his horse to the post where the in other Indians had. She also, she also mentions that Though his, by his pictures, Geronimo wearing a perpetual snarl appears to be short and squatty, Mrs. Roby said his obituary in the local paper listed his height at six feet. I always assumed he was super short as well. What are, what's your take on it? Well, <clears throat> there, there are uh, uh, some interesting pictures that uh, C.S. Fly took when uh, Geronimo was uh, talking surrender with General Crook in March of, of 1886. Mm -hmm. And we know the rifle that he had, he was holding it in his hands and you can uh, uh, look up how long that, that rifle was and then scale it to, uh, to his height. And he was 
he was somewhere around 5'11", 5'10", wow. okay. something like that. Yeah. Uh, his, uh, his portrait was painted uh, several times by Burbank, uh, and they uh, uh, became good friends. Uh, and for the first painting, uh, he charged uh, Burbank $5 to paint two pictures of it. Hmm. Uh, and he loved uh, horse racing and often used Zaye, his wife, as his jockey. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. He had a, <laughs> no way. He had a, a, a strict set of rules that uh, Barrett, his uh, autobiography, had to follow to get his autobiographical story. And the publication from Barrett is full of errors. He would he would not let uh, Barrett use a uh, stenographer to write down what he said, and Barrett had to uh, to write it oh. write it down from uh, memory as oh. they uh, as they went. And Barrett also had to get Teddy Roosevelt's permission to write it. Uh, the army was not going to uh, to let oh. Geronimo sell his story if they could possibly uh, uh, help it. And about about uh, six or seven months before he died, he was accused of being a witch and causing his children and grandchildren to die so he could live. Hmm. Wow. That's so interesting though. I mean, why didn't he want him to use a stenographer? Uh, <clears throat> Geronimo uh, uh, had, had led 15 men on his own. Uh, through a lot of a lot of uh, uh, killing and robbing and burning, <coughs> and uh, he was he was scared to death, along with the, the the men he had led, that if he told the straight out truth on it, uh, uh, he uh, uh, might be charged with. Uh, some uh, uh, legal thing and uh, and get hung for what they had done, and so he was oh. he was very careful to uh, to be sure that uh, uh, Barrett heard exactly what he wanted him to hear, and, and so he yeah. didn't tell the whole tale. The problem was that that uh, uh, Barrett tried to put. Uh, things together so it made a coherent story when uh, Geronimo was kind of jumping around all over the place about, about <laughs> what uh, he was doing. Right, right. Oh, wow. Oh, to be a fly on the wall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so let's talk about Geronimo's family life. You mentioned some, you know, areas earlier in one of the books that you've written about some of that private side of Geronimo. Um, and we know he had a wife and kids who were killed, but, and he remarried and had more kids, correct? Yeah, during his, during his captivity, Geronimo fathered two children, lost three wives, married two more, uh, and, and uh, this was all while he was a prisoner of war. Hmm. By my count, over his, over his lifetime, he had 10 wives and 14 children, give or take. Wow. During, during his uh, captivity, he was married to uh, Shiga, Zaye, and Ateta. Zaye had, uh, had Ava, his last child. Ateta had Lena before they were divorced, but conceived while they were renegades. And Robert, who was born seven months after they were divorced. Geronimo didn't know about Robert until the boy was about 15. Hmm. He wouldn't let uh, Eva marry because women in his family often died at childbirth. He claimed that he Aww. had a, a vision that if she did marry, she would die from childbirth. After he died, she married and had a child a year later. The baby died in a couple of months. And she died from TB a year later. Whoa. Wow. That is so sad. And then isn't there a story about 
his sending one of his wives away. Yeah, that was Ateta. She was she was a, a, a young Mescalero woman that he had uh, actually kidnapped when she was uh, on a pass on the reservation, uh, helping women uh, uh, gather, gather uh, pinon nuts, which were in a very good uh, season that year. Uh, but uh, she was down in the, uh, what's called the boot heel of uh, New Mexico. Uh, but when the, uh, when the army came through and uh, rushed all of the, uh, all of the Chiricahuas to Florida, including the ones that had been perfectly peaceful, they uh, uh, wound up taking about seven Mescaleros they hadn't intended to take uh, to Florida. And uh, when, when the word got out, that they had done that, the uh, the Mescaleros were uh, on the uh, on the army to uh, to let the Mescaleros go. Oh, and okay. uh, uh, when when Geronimo found out that uh, they were going to let the Mescaleros go, he had uh, had just been involved in uh, burying uh, a child there at Mount Vernon Barracks. And uh, he decided that uh, he had to let uh, Tata go uh, back to Mescalero in order to save her life and Lena's. Otherwise, he was sure they would they would die from from uh, some white eye disease. And so uh, the the drill, if he if, if an Apache man wanted to uh, divorce his his wife. He told her to go back to her parents, and that was the end of it. Mm. Well, that's basically what he told uh, Ateta to do. Oh. Although he had kidnapped her in the beginning, uh, she loved him, and she did not want to go. Oh. And he uh, and he basically insisted that she do that, and so you know, you you see a a uh, a, a picture of. Uh, of a man that that was willing to uh, to sacrifice to that extent so that uh, so that his family could live you know and that's one wow. of the things i think that kind of makes him stand out in the uh, odyssey of geronimo story definitely and, and she was even carrying a secret with her wasn't she yeah she was uh, she was pregnant when she left I'm not, I'm not even sure that, uh, uh, I know Geronimo didn't know, and it's, it's not clear to me if she knew either, although surely she must have. So, wow. There you That's go. so sad. The story. Oh my goodness. And, and then there's another story. You'll have to tell me if this one is true of his killing one of his wives because she wouldn't come with him on the war path. No, that's absolutely false. False. Uh, we need like a false button. <laughs> <laughs> Geronimo never killed any wife, uh, and in the in the in the uh, Apache culture, uh, if if a woman didn't want to do what uh, what her husband told her to do, she had she had a choice. <laughs> Okay. She could, she could either uh, submit to a beating oh. or she could pack it up and leave and, and divorce it. Right. Yeah. And you, you, uh, you look through the, uh, what happened to the various people that, uh, that rode with uh, Geronimo. And uh, uh, if a woman didn't want to come with her man, and there are several instances uh, where this was true, then, uh, uh, when he went on the war path and he would divorce her and find some, someone else who would. And, uh, I guess one of the classic examples of, of this is, uh, his brother Perico, uh, had, uh, wife wouldn't go with him, uh, when, uh, he left with Geronimo in 1875. And, uh, when they, when they, uh, captured, uh, Ateta, uh, there was a there was a, a woman that uh, had been with her named uh, Bayonetta. Mm -hmm. Bayonetta uh, 
uh, agreed to marry Perico, he uh, he really liked the, the way that she handled herself and and uh, took care of took care of things and seemed to have a lot of courage. And so uh, he uh, he asked to marry her, and she uh, and she agreed. It's funny, you know, the the uh, uh, picture of the of the Geronimo group sitting on the uh, on the berm with the with the railroad car above them. Are you mm -hmm. familiar with that picture? There's a there's a, a woman sitting in the background who's kind of looking over her shoulder at the camera. Uh, and she has been identified as the great warrior woman Lozen. And oh. uh, and that is incorrect. That woman oh. was actually Bayonetta. Oh See, oh my goodness. <laughs> you have really been out there exposing some of these false stories. For sure. Wow. So you have to tell us about the story of, is it Francesca or Francisco? What's the name? Francesca. Francesca. Okay. Yeah. Tell us more about that. Uh, Francesca was uh, was with a, a group of women and children that were uh, that were running with Victorio, and when Victorio got wiped out, uh, there were several that, that were survived that the Mexicans took uh, and uh, carried to uh, what they call the City of Mules. It's actually uh, Chihuahua City. Uh, and there they were they were put in prison until a, uh, a slave buyer came by and uh, and, and uh, took them. Francesca is supposed to have been the the grandmother of of the group of women that uh, this this uh, buyer bought. There were there were like five of them, mm -hmm. and they carried her to uh, a, a mezcal plantation. Uh, just a little north of Mexico City, and there they worked for uh, for nearly five years. Uh, and uh, uh, what what took them so long to get away was they they didn't have access to a knife, and uh, uh, they were not about to leave unless they could have a blanket and a knife. And eventually, Francesca managed to uh, steal one from a, a butcher in the market when there was a, a disturbance and he wasn't watching things. Ah. And uh, uh, she set things up with the, with the other uh, four. And uh, one night they were supposed to be going to church and they were trusted to go to church by themselves. They took off. Ah. And uh, they, uh, the, uh, another reason that they went at that particular time of the year was Francesca uh, uh, had watched the, uh, the fruit on prickly pear uh, uh, ripen. And she noticed that as you came uh, further south, it ripened sooner. And as you went north, it, it would ripen a little later. Mm -hmm. So she uh, determined that if they if they left when uh, the tuna was was uh, ripe at uh, 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 Mexico City, then uh, they could keep <coughs> up with it ripening as it as they went north, and uh, they got away. They hid under bridges uh, and. Uh, a couple of times they found a, uh, a cow that they were able to slaughter and uh, make, make uh, green leather uh, moccasins for themselves. And they were, they were just about into the, uh, into the United States, about ready to cross the border one night when they uh, camped out in a, uh, a mountain lion got in their uh, uh, little shelter 
grabbed her and took off and the other women went after him uh, trying to stab him with, a, with their knives and uh, uh, Francesca uh, finally got away from him but he had he had very nearly scalped her with his uh, claws and teeth oh my god and uh, left her face in in, a, in bad shape they took a couple of weeks to uh, to sit with her and take care of her and then they uh, they picked up and went on and I estimate that 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 uh, over the space of about five months, they covered something like twelve hundred miles on wow. foot. Huh. So uh, when she uh, when she got got back to the uh, uh, Fort Apache Reservation, uh, her husband was gone. I mean, he had died, and. Uh, uh, None of the men were, were interested in taking her except Geronimo, who thought that, that even though uh, she was badly disfigured, she, uh, she had shown uh, remarkable courage and uh, fortitude to, to do what she had done. And he married her. Uh, she lasted, uh, I think, less than a year with him before she finally passed away. Uh -huh. What a woman! Man, it makes me wonder what I'm doing with my life. <laughs> <laughs> These women back then were so tough. And supposedly she's buried at Fort Sill, but from what I can tell, it doesn't list her as Geronimo's wife and she's away from the other members of the family. Um, have you seen that too in your research? Uh, she is, is really a kind of a... a, a uh ghost-like figure. I, I really haven't been able to, uh, to do much to track her. The, the only reason that I know that uh, she was married to Geronimo was that uh, Geronimo told uh, her grandson, and he actually was not her grandson, he was more like a, a second or third cousin, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, he had married his his grandmother Francesca, and uh, uh, that was uh, a young man named. Uh, uh, her grandson was a young man named Eugene Chihuahua. Earlier, we talked about how Geronimo might have had some supernatural powers. He was truly credited with being a medicine man, right? Oh yeah, he uh, he was a very powerful medicine man. As a matter of fact. Uh, the, the historical record shows that uh, he had what I would call supernatural power. Uh, he could hold his hands out, uh, palms up out in front of him and slowly rotate. And when his hands got warm, and people have testified that they could feel his hands getting uh, uh, hotter than usual, Ooh. that was the direction that the enemy was coming from. Uh, wow. And uh, uh, most Apaches were uh, uh, scared to death of him. Uh, he could predict uh, 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 which enemies were coming, uh, their time and arrival on a particular section of trail. And he saw visions of things that were happening miles away. It's The, the story goes that when uh, General Crook went into uh, uh, Mexico and his his scouts uh, attacked a, a, a camp uh, that uh, uh, Chato and Bonito were responsible for. Uh, Geronimo was sitting 120 miles away eating with the with the rest of them. He uh, he was eating a piece of beef and he had his knife out, and suddenly. Uh, they say his, his eyes took on like a 10,000 mile stare. He dropped his, uh, he dropped his knife and, and said, uh, brothers, the blue coats are, are in our camp and have taken over our food and our families. Oh, wow. And the, the men that were with him uh, found it very hard to believe and they immediately left that night and, and three or four days later, they got there and found that that's exactly what had happened. Oh, wow. So he was seeing these visions and it, it was more than just, uh, well, it sounds like all of his visions came true. So 
more than yeah. just myth, right? Yeah, I think so. Interesting. So you'll notice in photos of Geronimo, his hair in a lot of those photos is above shoulder length at a time when many grew their hair long. So why was his hair shorter? Well, he was he was in the army, uh, and he he joined the army at uh, Mount Vernon Barracks in order for them to pay him to become a justice of the peace for the Apaches at Mount Vernon. And so if he was in the army, he had to have his hair cut to regulation length. Uh -huh. All of them. Yeah. Yeah, there's um, some some very false statements out there that said that it was because he was mourning uh, the loss of his first wife. Uh, so we know that to be a false button scenario as well. <clears throat> Yeah. Now I have something a little different to share with you listeners. And although the stories have been put out there for years in articles and even um, some magazines that are reputable and all of that, we will find out at the end if this story is true or not. So Michael will have his imaginary false button ready to, at the ready, just in case. So, <laughs> but one thing that is true is the accusation itself so there was an accusation flying around there i do know that much is true so listeners have you ever heard of skull and bones the ultra secret society founded in 1832 at yale university my daughter went to yale so i've been to the skull and bones building which doesn't have any signage or markers and you know the students can show you where it is but of course, I haven't gone in because clearly I'm not a member, nor have I ever gone to Yale. So um, I'll read to you from excerpts from IndianCountryToday.com in 2018, an article by Stephen Newcomb called The Order of Skull and Bones and Geronimo. The membership list of Skull and Bones reads like a who's who of some of the wealthiest and most powerful English Puritan families in the United States, families that were some of the earliest arist aristocratic arrivals to North America in the period from 1630 to 1660. These also were some of the powerful families that helped orchestrate the colonization and theft of Indian lands throughout the history of the United States. Skull and Bones families have been among the most powerful and influential banking and corporate interests in the world. Members of Skull and Bones are known as Bonesmen. Legend has it that Prescott Bush and several fellow Bonesmen dug up the grave of Geronimo in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, where they were stationed as military officers during World War I. They are said to have taken Geronimo's skull and femur bones back to the tomb, the Skull and Bones headquarters on the Yale campus. The recently, lo the recently located 1918 letter supports the story. The letter written from one student to another reports that the skull of the worthy Geronimo, the terrible, is exhumed from its tomb at Fort Sill and is now safe at their Yale clubhouse. So, Michael, is this true or false? Not true. Not true. Okay, so B, okay. it's false. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you read the actual letter carefully, uh -huh. it tells you why it's false. Okay. The letter, the letter says that the officers broke into a tomb and then dug up the bones. The Apache Cemetery was about three or four miles from the main base across occasionally swampy land, and the graves were marked with standard wooden army grave markers. Uh -huh. By 1918, most Apaches didn't even know where the cemetery was. Oh, the cemetery... Really? The cemetery the officers went to was the one that's just off the quadrangle at the main base. Mm -hmm. It's where Quanah Parker is buried. The only grave site with a tomb to be broken into the way the letter describes, and they say uh, they took an ax and chopped off the, uh, the lock that was on the tomb door. <clears throat> uh, uh, the only, uh, the only grave site with a tomb to be broken into that way, the letter describes, was that of a Kiowa chief kicking bird. Oh. And so these officers uh, uh, probably did get in the tomb, dig up the bones, uh, and uh, the letter says that they uh, went, went back to their uh, room and uh, cleaned the skull up and boiled it in water, et cetera. But the fact is, Geronimo had fooled the army again. 
very interesting that, um, first off, obviously that is way against the law now. I mean, it, if there yeah. is any skull are any skulls and bones in the Yale clubhouse, they need to obviously need to be returned. And, and really people are up in arms about it even today, whether it, was Geronimo's bones or someone else's bones they need to be yeah. returned yeah. um but what a in a way what a sad story but also kind of interesting the little mystery around all of it and just shows how pompous some people can be that's absolutely ridiculous well thanks for shedding light on that story as well <laughs> <laughs> So after meeting with Roosevelt, Geronimo was photographed with Ponca chief Edward Leclerc. He loved Leclerc's beaded vest so much that the chief gave it to him. And four years later, Geronimo died and he was buried with his most prized possessions, one of those being that beaded vest. Love him or hate him, Geronimo used what he could to make a living. He had quite a nest egg put together by the time he passed away, didn't he? Uh, yeah, by by a dollar's value two years ago, he would have had about $270,000 in his bank account and Lawton from uh, selling pictures that he had autographed himself and bows and arrows and all the, all the other uh, touristy stuff. Not bad. He, Not bad. He did, yeah. And, and many natives thought Geronimo was a sellout for doing that kind of thing. Maybe so, or maybe they were jealous. Who knows? I do know. I have a whole new respect for the man now, you know, forgetting the pomp and circumstance and, and all the things that happened after he had surrendered. He was a strong and skilled warrior. He evaded 5,000 soldiers running miles upon miles day after day and survived battle after battle. Um, what what are your thoughts about the whole Geronimo about the Geronimo being a sellout thing? Well, I I I think it's uh, it's uh, uh, not not very uh, accurate. Geronimo Geronimo on the on the train to Florida when it would stop at these various places and big crowds would show up to try to see him. And some would buy buttons off of his shirt mm. and he'd cut it off wow. and sell it to him and then sew another one back on. Pretty resourceful. And, and he, uh, and he uh, sold bows and arrows uh, to, uh, to the whites uh, because uh, he, he kind of looked down his nose at them. He uh, uh, thought that they were fools for buying a child's toy and paying good money uh, for what he was for what he was selling, so he really thought that he was taking advantage of people that uh, mm -hmm. uh, wanted to uh, buy his uh, buy his stuff. Just just a, a point about the uh, five thousand soldiers. Mm -hmm. He actually evaded. 5,000 U.S. soldiers, but on the other side of the border were 3,000 Mexican military and numerous posses for, uh, for five months. And he never lost a man, woman, or child from being wounded or captured. Wow. Seriously? That's, That's true. amazing. <laughs> yeah. See, skilled and a leader in so many ways, too. Well, he knew the uh, he knew the countryside. Mm -hmm. He was a he was a hard eyed killer, but he was paranoid about being put back in the guardhouse. He wanted peace, but he wasn't willing to pay the price for it. And he was exceptionally shrewd and tactically clever, and he was interested in himself first, his family next and then his people, and a very few friends in the outside world. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I, I admire and respect him and what he was able to accomplish under hard, difficult circumstances, but I don't romanticize him as some would for being an Apache patriot. Okay, yeah. I mean, if you think about it, he was a man surviving in a lot of ways, and and I have to say, I, I kind of respect that, honestly, because he he surrendered, he made that choice, and then he yeah. figured out a way to survive after that. And I think that's kind of interesting, but I, I'm with you. Lots of respect for a lot of his um, 
his talent, but you know, we got to be careful with that romanticization thing because sometimes that's where the crazy stories come in, come in. (laughs) So, well, on February 17th, 1909, Geronimo, the warrior passed away. How did he die? Well, there are actually two versions of this. Uh, One says that uh, he was riding, riding home drunk, fell off his horse uh, and uh, 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 had part of his body in in a creek overnight. And uh, uh, friends found him, but his uh, health was was deteriorating. He already had pneumonia and he passed away six days later with his nephew at his side. Mm-hmm. The other story and one that uh, uh, I tend to accept because uh, uh, there's, there's just no reason to lie was his step grandson, the, uh, the step, uh, uh, the, the grandson of uh, Francesca, Eugene chihuahua says that uh, geronimo had had sat outside and and lawton uh, uh one one day selling his bows and arrows it was cold and windy and uh when uh, geronimo saw him coming down the street he stood up and reached in his pocket and got out a, a gold coin and, and pulled uh, uh chihuahua over dropped the coin in his hand and said, I need some whiskey. I'm about to freeze. Uh, can you get it for me? Well, uh, Chihuahua, who was in the seventh cavalry at the time, uh, wore a suit that was, that was so, uh, uh, well fitted to his body that he couldn't, he couldn't put a quarter in his pocket without people knowing about it. And mm-hmm. so, uh, he got a friend of his to uh, to buy a a bottle of uh, rye with the gold coin, put it on a on a corner post on a fence that was next to the saloon where he bought it, and uh, uh, he rode by and snatched the bottle, and he and and Geronimo wound up uh, having a little fire and drinking session uh, on Cash Creek, and. Uh, they, they went to went to sleep and it started raining and uh, Geronimo apparently didn't sleep all night. He kept he kept coughing and uh, that's what eventually woke uh, Chihuahua up. And Chihuahua heard the gurgling in his chest and he immediately took him to, uh, to the Apache hospital and he died there three days later. Mm. That's the second version. And you tend to think that maybe the second version is probably the most accurate between the two. Yeah, uh, because uh, that's the story that uh, Eugene Chihuahua told uh, Eve Ball at uh, Mescalero. And uh, uh, he was, Chihuahua was was, uh, uh, a very religious man and there was just no reason for him to tell a lie. So, you know, I, I have trouble. Uh, except in the other version that's the one i'm gonna mostly accept as well then interesting oh it's it's such a sad story though to think about what he went through in his entire life and then and then that's how he would pass away and again he's buried at fort sill in beef creek apache cemetery i'll be sure to share some of my photos from visits to the grave over the years on my native chalk talk facebook page I think about the great warriors, leaders, and chiefs of these tribes that one by one were surrendering. Many of them got to know each other after their surrenders. I wonder what it must have been like to come together and know that they had been defeated, but also knowing that they had made the choice that would keep what was left of their tribes alive. And once they started passing away over the years, it must have also been a strange time. These people like Geronimo and Quanah Parker saw the last of the free Indians forever changed. Those legendary American Indians are now gone, and amazingly enough, many of them, their stories still live on. Keeping those stories alive is possibly the only thing we can do to honor them. Geronimo never did get back home, did he? No, he never did. Uh, Those who controlled his fate wouldn't risk the chance of another war between the Chiricahuas and the settlers who were looking 
payback for all the grief that your cows have brought him. He was different things to different people, a warrior, a vengeful man, sometimes cranky, a businessman, a husband and father and a survivor. What would you personally like to say about Geronimo, Michael? He was an epic man and an epic story. His life that followed, his was a life that uh, followed an overwhelming desire to live free and be independent. Well said. So what's next for you in your world of writing? Uh, after, after Trini Come comes out and it's, uh, it's going to be released uh, in mid-November, I'll have a, uh, a duology, two books on uh, Chato, uh, who for years was Geronimo's uh, Segundo, his number two, <laughs> until uh, Chato, uh, desperate to get his family out of Mexican slavery, became a lead army scout and uh, bitter enemies with Geronimo when Geronimo broke out the last time. Geronimo called him a liar and a traitor, but Chato was none of those. The way the army treated him after he helped catch Geronimo is one of the most shameful times in American history. Surprisingly enough, Chato's life has some remarkable parallels to uh, uh, Geronimo. He's been called Geronimo's doppelganger, his life shadow. And I'm going, and I'm also doing research to write a novel tentatively titled Justice, question mark, about the life and times of Apache Kid and a novel uh, call, uh, tentatively titled Lost, involving uh, Yellow Boy, Henry Grace, and Genoza in a 1919 search for what happened to the hidden Apaches in Mexico. Ooh. Are you, how do you have time for all this? It's amazing. Well, I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> Please take me with you. <laughs> oh, I want to be on that retirement train. Well, um, and listeners, stay tuned because we're actually going to be talking more in another season about some of the, uh, well, some of the characters that Michael just talked about. So it's a big surprise. I can't wait for us to talk more about that. You're going to want to check out these books by W. Michael Farmer, and there's a whole array of books and topics to choose from. Michael, what's the best way for people to find and purchase your books? Uh, well, go to the website and uh, you can you can read uh, little synopses for uh, for each book. Uh, they're nearly all on uh, uh, Amazon or Barnes and Noble online, and uh, you can also buy them from uh, uh, brick and mortar bookstores. Okay, great. And if you want a, if you want a signed copy, uh, you can use the email on my website. Let me know, and I'll, uh, I'll send you one in, in turn for a check or a PayPal. All right, perfect. And, and something I've been really enjoying following is your Killer of Witches Facebook page. That's a great one for y'all to follow on Facebook as well. And, and I'll, again, be sure to share all of this information on my Native Chalk Talk Facebook page. Again, super easy to find, wmichaelfarmer.com. So before we go, though, are there any words of wisdom you would like to share with our listeners? Uh, yeah, if you, if you want to understand a people's history, first understand their culture. Uh, in 1955, Paul Blazer, whose father and grandfather ran a sawmill and a store for the Mescalero Apaches, uh, told Dr. C.L. Sunnickson, the great chronicler of the Southwest, quote, I hate to hear people talk about those Apaches as savages. If an Indian is a savage, a lot of white men are savages too. Hmm. Teddy Roosevelt was a savage. Some of the Mescaleros were savage, but they were no worse than the white men who hit them in the rear with the saddle. They used to come in the store where I worked. I would give them a smoke and they would sit around and tell me stories, folk tales, 
There was poetry and beauty in them. That was when I began to see that they were folks just like us. That is the point of my work. We need to see the humanity and history, no matter how offensive the culture might seem. Beautifully said. Thank you so much, Michael. And I thank you for taking us on this fascinating journey through Geronimo's life. And I look forward to continuing to read those W. Michael Farmer books. Well, I hope you, uh, I hope you enjoy them. And I certainly uh, thank you for asking me to come along. Absolutely. Cheers. Salute. The Choctaw Nation has always provided a foundation upon which a future can be built. From our home in Southeast Oklahoma to a bingo hall that grew to be one of the largest casinos in the world. Today's summer school programs lay the groundwork for a love of learning. Small business programs support local economies. And with over 10,000 jobs created, Choctaw offers financial stability to tribal members and our neighbors. Together we build success because together we're more. Thanks for listening to Native Chalk Talk. Be sure to join our community on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Simply search for Native Chalk Talk. That's Native C-H-O-C-T-A-L-K. And check us out at nativechalktalk.com. Stay tuned for the next episode. You're going to love it. Yakoki. Thank you, my friends. <laughs>